today we're going to start talking about uh, contact forces, which we've said were the sum of lots of electric interactions, but we're going to look at them in great detail. We're going we're to, like Fantastic Journey, we're going to zoom down inside the materials and see what's going on inside them that's leading to these, uh, the forces that all the objects around us exert on us when we touch them or pull on them or things like that. Um, this isn't as boring as it sounds, and in fact, there's some there's some kind of interesting puzzles about contact forces. So consider the following situation: you have a a physics instructor standing on the floor, and there are various forces on this physics instructor. Surely, the Earth is pulling down. However, the physics instructor's momentum is not changing. This suggests that if her momentum is remaining constant, then that force on her must be zero, which must mean the floor is exerting a, a force upward. So we can, we can figure out the force that the floor is exerting on me. Um, so the system is the physics instructor. And the surroundings, lots of things, but the most important things are the Earth, which is interacting at a distance. I'm not really in contact with it. And the floor, which is a contact force. And so we can draw a diagram. And we can write down the momentum principle and solve for the force the floor is exerting on me. So we should draw the forces uh, on the system. So here's the gravitational force due to the Earth. And there's some force upward due to the floor. These, are off, these forces are often called normal forces, and it, that doesn't mean ordinary. It's normal in the mathematical sense of being perpendicular to something. So the floor is, the force is perpendicular to the, to the floor, so it's called a normal force. We're going to put floor in parentheses so we know that we've, we've got a real object exerting this. And now we can use the momentum principle. So we say the final momentum of our system is equal to the momentum now plus F net delta T. And it's sort of arbitrary what, what time we choose. Um, we can say delta T is going to be 2 tenths of a second, maybe, because since my momentum wasn't changing, it's not really going to matter. And now my initial momentum was 0. And my momentum after two seconds, at two tenths of a second, is zero. And that suggests that F net acting on me must have been zero during that time. Okay, not rocket science. And we know that the net force is going to be the sum of the gravitational force on me plus the force due to the floor. And so we can we can solve this. Say my mass is about 60 kilograms, and so we have this is going to be uh, in the negative y direction. So it's minus 60 kilograms, and we'll approximate the the Earth's gravitational field is 10 newtons per kilogram. 9.8 is nearly 10 times um, plus whatever the force by the floor is. And uh, so this looks like the force by the floor, the normal force, is going to be 0, uh, 600, 0 newtons. So the floor, so we've just found that the floor is exerting it. Can exert a 600 newton force. 
Okay, not very exciting. But now suppose that a 15-kilogram little kid comes along and stands in that place. So what's going to happen when the little kid stands in that place? Well, let's apply the momentum principle for the little kid. So we have for the kid whose mass is only 15 kilograms, we have P final is P initial plus F net delta T. And the kid was standing still initially. And the net force on the kid is still going to be the sum of the force by the floor and the force by the earth. So we have the gravitational force, which is going to be 0, 15 kilograms times 10 newtons per kilogram in the minus y direction, 0. And then the force by the floor, which we decided was 0, 600, 0 newtons. And that's times 0.2 seconds. So this comes out to negative 150 newtons, and that's 600. So it looks like the momentum of the kid after 0.2 seconds is going to be 600 plus negative 150 is going to be 0, uh, 450, 0 newtons times 0.2 seconds, or uh, 0, 90, 0 kilogram meters per second, which corresponds to a, a speed, a velocity. So V final, P final over the mass. So we're going to divide by 15. Uh, and we get 0, 3, 0, wait, 15, 6. meters per second. So the kid is, is going upward at six meters per second after two seconds from standing there on the floor, right? Well, obviously not. But what's wrong with what we did here? Okay, a kid comes and stands in that spot, a little kid. They're not going to shoot upwards toward the ceiling just from standing there. What's, what's, what's wrong with this? So it, yeah, so it's we know that we haven't calculated the gravitational force on the kid wrong. We know how to do that. So this must not really be the force the floor is exerting on the kid. The, the floor must be exerting a force that's smaller in magnitude. How does it know it should do that? It's just a floor. It's not even alive. How does it know it should exert a smaller upward force on a little kid than on an adult? Well, the kid is indeed exerting less force on the floor, but why does that make the floor do something? It's just a floor. That's a puzzle. That's a puzzle. So indeed, we, we reason from the momentum principle that the force the floor exerts on something in contact with it must indeed depend on the force that object is exerting on the floor. But the question is, how does it do that? And to understand that and understand what's going on, um, we're going to need to look inside, <laughs> inside the floor. Here, here's another example that, that's a storyline that starts in chapter 4 in the textbook and then goes through chapter 5. <laughs> So Tarzan. Tarzan decides he's going to swing across a river on a vine. And Tarzan's had a lot of experience with vines, and he knows some of them are stronger than others. So he wants to test the vine to make sure that it's actually going to be strong enough to support his weight. So he climbs up on the cliff. He takes this vine. He hangs from it for a while. It's fine. It supports his weight. This is a good, strong vine. So he backs up grabs a vine, swings across the river, and he's very chagrined when, when he reaches the lowest point of his trajectory, the vine breaks. And he ends up in the river, and all the apes are standing on the side going, <laughs> and he's embarrassed. 
and he's also wet, and he doesn't understand what he did wrong because he tested the vine. He knows it was strong enough. It seems like maybe something changed when he was swinging on the vine. Maybe something was different. Yeah. You think the... Oh, you think he's stretching the vine. Well, that's interesting. We never talk about stretching and compressing things when we're in contact with them. But in fact, it does seem like something like that must be going on. And surely it affects what happens with with Tarzan and the vine, with the kid in the floor. So... um, Richard Feynman, who was... One of the, you may have heard his name, one of the greatest physicists of the, the 20th century. In the, very, in the famous Feynman Lectures on Physics, says this. So this is, this is the, you know, after the Holocaust scenario, he says, if in some cataclysm all of scientific knowledge were destroyed and only one sentence passed on to the next generations of creatures, what statement would contain the most information in the fewest words? I believe it's the atomic hypothesis or atomic fact or whatever you want to call it that all things are made of atoms, little particles that move around in perpetual motion, attracting each other when they're a little distance apart, but repelling upon being squeezed into one another. In that sentence, you'll see there's an enormous amount of information about the world if just a little imagination and thinking are applied. So we're going to be thinking about and imagining atoms. Um, And the idea is we want to understand what happens to objects that are made of atoms like floors and vines and wires and and things like that when they're in contact with other objects. And so that's that's what we're going to be doing. Now, um, what we're going to talk about is a model of solid objects that sounds simple, but turns out to be physically very powerful. And the idea is this, that, that a solid object, and we're going we're gonna to talk about um, simple, well-organized solids, which we're, we're going to talk about solid metals for a while, just because their, their structure, internal structure is simpler and better organized than, say, wood or vines. And the idea is that The atoms, so in a block of aluminum, there's a bunch of aluminum atoms, right? Well, how are they arranged? Well, they turn out to be arranged in very regular arrays. It's called a a lattice, a three-dimensional array, so that if you sliced a block of aluminum or copper and then you just looked at the, the surface, you'd see... Atoms laid out in a regular pattern, regular pattern, regular pattern. This is what's called a cubic lattice because we've placed an atom, which is represented by the red ball at every corner of a cube. And these balls are connected by springs. Okay, so what on earth do balls, plastic balls and springs have to do with atoms? Well, actually quite a lot, it turns out. So the basic idea... Um, is, let's see if we can get rid of you for a minute, is this, that, um, that the, so what, what's an atom? Well, it's got a nucleus, right? Nucleus has protons and neutrons. Protons and neutrons are really very massive compared to the electrons which surround the nucleus in a cloud. So mass of a proton is about 10 to the minus 27th kilograms. Mass of an electron is about 10 to the minus 30th kilograms, so it's about 1,000 times less massive. So most of the mass is in the center, and that's what these balls represent, the, the sort of massive. Now, the massive nucleus is really very tiny compared to the electron cloud. So we can say here this is sort of like... Um, the nucleus and the inner electrons. What are the springs? Well, the springs are the chemical bonds. And in fact, it turns out, there's a reason we've been talking about springs a lot. It turns out that when you do all the complicated quantum mechanical theory, 
to understand where the electrons are and how they interact with the two nuclei of these things. And the, that a chemical bond in a solid, it's just a covalent bond, really is very well described by a spring. Because if there are two atoms that are bonded together and you try to shove them closer together, so I want to squish the top layer of atoms in this table closer to the next layer. Oh. It's hard to do. It's tough to do. It's hard to push them together. If you want to pull them apart, well, you can pull them apart, but they, they tend to come back together. So basically, the idea of two atoms bonded together with a chemical bond is very well described by the mathematics we've been using to talk about masses and springs. So you, you pull this apart, there's a restoring force. Try to push them closer together, there's a force. So they, it wants to be at some equilibrium distance. Um, so what's our goal? Our goal is today to see if we can deduce, figure out the characteristics of these spring-like interatomic bonds. Because if we could, if we could say a block of copper uh, is made of atoms whose mass we know because we know the mass of a mole of copper, and they're connected by bonds that we can model as springs with a particular spring stiffness, then we could, we could, we could predict a lot of things about copper. How much a block of copper would compress if we put a certain a, a physics textbook on top of it. How much a copper wire would stretch if we hung something from it? Uh, what would happen if we took a block of, say, copper or aluminum and we banged on one end with a hammer and all these disturbances propagated down? How long would it take to get to the other end? So there are a lot of things we can predict. So our goal for today is to figure out the characteristics of these these interatomic bonds considered as springs. And to do that, so I remind you that our ball and spring model, the balls and springs there, really are representing the very massive tiny nucleus and the inner electrons. And then the spring is this covalent chemical bond, which really is the merged with the outer electron cloud. So we're there's, there's no little coiled wires in there, but but this is, our, this is our model of how the world works. It turns out this is a good enough model that people studying materials like metals and other materials still use it to do very seri fairly serious calculations. Um, so this is, this is something that's, that's genuinely used. 